class this morning is a life changer. I hope. I'll pray. Our Father in Heaven, bless us this morning as we seek to find something that's going to help us. It's going to give us hope and change us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Hebrews 11, verse 25. Sin is sweet for a what? Season. But after a season, it always turns sour. Thank you, says Nicole. It always turns sour. Part 16. Do not think that when you walk with Jesus, you must walk in the shadow. When my trust slips, my happiness slips every single time. Read the rest, Sister Nicole. The happiest people in the world are those who trust in Jesus and gladly do His bidding. If you don't trust in Him, your life is sour, miserable. It's sour, right? Now, I'm looking for some medicine this morning. How about you? What's the best pill to take? Uh, 17, well, let's take the Bible. 17, 22 of Proverbs, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. John 13, 17, happy are ye, I'm sorry, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do it. This is a prescription for happiness this morning, autoimmune disease. Everything from uh, osteoarthritis, the lupus, uh, multiple scler sclerosis, the the they're multiplying exponentially the so-called fibromyalgia, these autoimmune diseases. Here is a picture of Sergeant Neutrophil and Sergeant Lymphocyte, right? <laughs> they are your, the bad boys of the immune system. When the enemy comes in, they think one thing, gonna kill, right? The pathogens come in, bacteria and viruses, these are the guys that fight. Bad news for bad bacteria. Now, Tarnak Farm incident. You know, I don't know if you heard of this. This is the uh, this is the American who blew up the Canadians. In the military, we call that what? Friendly, Friendly fire. fire. This is when the good guys are killing the good guys. That's upside down and backwards. When your immune system kills yourself, you're being, you're a victim of what? Friendly fire. This is a picture of the balanced immune system. When the bad guys come in, the autoimmune system, the immune system opens fire. But when the good guys comes in, <laughs> right? So this is a nice picture of upstairs immune overreaction. Peanuts are good, aren't they? Can it send some folks into anaphylactic shock? Yes, I got on a Delta flight one time. We'll be serving no peanuts today. I knew why, I knew why the, the flight person said that. Why? Some of you just smell the peanuts and it does that. Be serving no peanuts today, and then she explained why. There's nothing wrong with a peanut. I like peanuts, don't you? The problem is your immune system, all right? Food allergies, you got all kinds of different things. Now below, cancer, AIDS, all these different viruses and things. Uh, it lets the bad guys in, but friendly fires the good guys. Now God designed that all of these things, the payers pay, yeah, the tonsils, the lymph nodes, all the parts of the immune system be working together for what? Good. To do what? Keep you happy. So far, so good. Now, typical American diet. Can, can it knock out your immune system? Yes. And give me an example of uh, something that would build up your immune system. Any food. Any food in the world that will build you up. Citrus, that's citrus. You're a step ahead of me. <laughs> I use citrus because that's what I had. Right, so you have to read it since you said it, Nicole. Boost your immune system naturally. Yeah. Make from whole foods rich in vitamin C and D and loaded with antioxidants and anti-inflammatory ingredients to revitalize and energize your immune system. And I didn't go looking for this. This is all over, right? If you want a strong immune system, eat a grapefruit. And if you want to knock out your immune system, eat a... Thank you. I'll read. <laughs> Typical, come on. <laughs> we were ESPing here. Typical American diet can damage your immune system. So what should I eat? Whole food, plant-based. You know, I, I do this health thing on this uh, this thing, and people can't get it. Well, really? To I'll eat tofu then. No, don't eat tofu. That's highly processed and refined. Well, I'll eat olive oil. That's highly processed and refined. I'll, no, 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 no. Whole food. Well, what's whole food? Whole food is whole food. The way God made it. Whole from the ground. The way God made it. And, and it's just like question after question. No, that's no good. A lady, this was last week. I won't tell your name. She said, well, my brother? No, she said she had all these health issues. 
this is like on a broadcast thing, all these health issues. I said, are you on a whole food plant-based diet? She said, yes. I said, do you eat oil? She said, yes. I said, you're not on a whole food plant-based diet. <laughs> you're not on a whole food plant-based diet. God's plan is now. I got my breakfast in, whole food plant-based. Now I'm going to go out and do what to boost my immune system? Eat a burger. No, no, to boost my immune system. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> I might take a run in the sun, right? A run in the sun builds the immune system. How about you? But I want to take an extra measure of protection. I look at the shower. What should I say? <laughs> oh, hot and cold for me today, right? Will that boost the immune system? And now we're ready to start our subject today, how your attitude can make or break your immune system. We're living in the days of COVID-19, right? You want a strong immune system. Now we're coming with the science, right? There is a science. I'm going to read these first few ones because I've got a lot to cover in a short time. There is a science of Virginia Riff, Wisconsin University, and she brought out the facts. A science that is emerging that says a positive attitude is not just a state of mind, she says. It also has linkages to what's going on in the brain and in the body. Riff has shown that individuals with higher levels of well-being have lower cardiovascular risk, lower levels of stress hormones, lower levels of... How do they measure all that? Levels of inflammation, C-reactive protein, it's a blood test. As your uh, inflammation goes up, C-reactive protein goes up. Blood tests for these things, which serves as a marker of the immune system. You're telling me that if I got a rotten attitude, it can open me up to uh, getting a virus? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm telling you that. Sister Barbara, you want to read just the headline down there? Mayo Clinic. Um, positive thinking? Is that yep. Okay. Positive thinking stress, stops negative self talk to reduce stress. Self talk, talking to yourself, right? If you want to get a lot of stress, oh, this day is going to be a bad day. I can't believe what's going to happen to me. Don't know what's coming, but it can't be good. Now, next, Miss Sister Barbara. In praise of gratitude. That's coming from where? Harvard. Harvard. Even them secular people at Harvard are saying, well, we praise this thing, right? Not the name of the Lord, but we praise what? Gratitude, because gratitude has a, is a reflex action on your mind and your body. They don't say in your soul, but we say that, your soul. Mr. Barber, you want to read that again? How do thoughts and emotions impact health? In the, negativity and physical health. <laughs> negativity, you know. Well, you know. Now, I, know I, I, blew, yeah, I blew this one up. I thought I'd read it to you. Chronic stress from negative attitudes and feelings of helplessness and hopelessness. Is that you we're reading about now? Can upset the body's hormone balance, deplete the brain chemicals required for feelings of happiness, as well as have a damaging... Where's this coming from, the source? University it's the University of Minnesota. It's not www.quackery.com. It's not some guy that, that, that fishes with worms in the Arctic. No, this is real deal science. Uh, can deplete the brain chemicals required for feelings of happiness as well as have a damaging impact on the immune system. Poorly managed or repressed anger is also related to a slew of health conditions such as hypertension, cardiovascular disease, digestive disorders, and infection. Can a merry heart really straighten out my gastrointestinal system? Yes. But you've got a part to play. What is my part? Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say what? Rejoice. You got to have this kind of attitude, the biblical prescription for healing. 1722 of Proverbs, my merry heart's better than medicine. Would you agree? Now, in the, uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, This know also in the last days perilous times will come. And then verse 2, Men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud. But the seventh thing in the list is unthankful. Today are people unthankful. You do something nice for somebody. Maybe you make somebody a birthday cake. They don't even say thank you. You know? I mean, you've been, a, you've been head Sabbath school superintendent for 63 years. Then they ask you to leave. Nobody even said thank you. You open the door for somebody. You expect them to say, you give the lady your place in the line at Aldi's. You hope she's going to say, ain't going to say anything. People are unthankful. Now, here's the question. I call myself a Christian. So I ought to do what? Christ did. Not what Christians do. Don't do what Christians do. Do what? 
Christ did. If a Christian is doing what Christ did, it's okay for you to do what Christians do. But often, they don't. So I want to do what Christ does. Well, what does Christ do when somebody is not thankful to Him? Last part of the verse, Luke 6.35, what does He do? Kind. So, uh, you know, well, never mind. Gratitude. I looked it up. You know what it said in the dictionary? This is it. Why did Webster's? A feeling of thankfulness. I looked up thankfulness. It said a feeling of gratitude. Evidently, they're like synonymous. Now, I'm a Christian, so I pray the Lord's Prayer. Lord teaches to pray. Luke 11, 1, verse 2. When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Oh, thy kingdom come. Subject this morning, being thankful. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In everything, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I said it. Brian, you want to read it? In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Okay, 99% I'm going to give thanks. 100%. House burned down, what should you say? You. Praise the Lord. Once again, you're running two steps ahead of me. That's fine, though. That's good. Just don't run behind, right? Our subject this morning is not the immune system of the body. It's the immune system of the soul. Now, what's the first command in the Bible? I've asked this tricky question before. What's the first command in the Bible? Don't you say, I shall have no other gods before me. What's the first command in the Bible? Before that. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Because you didn't say it. Paul did. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, For God who commanded the light, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Genesis 1, 3, Let there be light. Isaiah 60, verse 1, Arise and shine, for thy light has come. John 1, 4, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Here, our subject this morning is now. That's commands. But when the Lord asks you to shine, He does not command, He invites. Is that true? Mm -hmm. He does not make you shine. Because if you did, that take away your choice. And if you had no choice, you can't say thank you. And you cannot love. Because being thankful is a choice. And you, aren't you happy about that? Let there be light. Now, no choice, no gratitude. If you don't have a choice, you can't say thank you. Because that's got to be a choice. Now, are there uh, contagious diseases in the Old Testament? Is there a quarantine system in the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. Sister Leah, you want to read? And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent, and his head bare, and he shall put a covering upon his upper lip, and shall cry out. Unclean! Unclean! So if I'm out there in the woods, the priest has examined me, sent me out of the camp because I'm leprous, and I see you folks taking a walk in the morning down to Butler Creek Road, and I say, what? Unclean! Unclean! unclean. Now instead of looking at your faces, I'm looking at what? The backs, the backs of your heads. Because when you hear that unclean, the natural human tent, boom, you run like a, like a my, my mother would say, a scalded dog, whatever that means. <laughs> Verse 46, Sister Leah. All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone. Without the camp shall his habitation be. They say, as far as population density in the daytime, Manhattan is one of the most populated places on earth during the daytime. Can you live in Manhattan, right? Squ right squ uh, what's that way of something? Times Square? Slap dab. That's a slap dab. <laughs> slap dab. I knew Times Square. I didn't know slap dab. Can you live slap dab in the middle, smack dab, <laughs> whatever it is. Can you live slap smack dab in the middle of Manhattan and be lonely? Yes. Can you be in a place like this and be utterly lonely? Yes. Yeah, it's tough, isn't it? Without the camp shall his habitation be. Of course, we're reading 1,500 years. Remember this, 1,500 years B.C. We're about to make the leap 15 centuries to Luke 17 and Christ walking into town. Who's he approached by? How many of them are there, Ryan? Ten. Well, how many did he heal? All ten. Now, you tell me how many came back and said thank you. One. One. And that was a no-account Samaritan. Those nine Jews, raptured, right? No, boom, like that, right? 
a, a slap dab, what is it called? Smack dab. smack dab, smack dab raptured. Where'd they go? Even Jesus himself, verse 18, what did he say? He says, where are the other nine? Where are the other nine? Verse 18, they're not found that return to give glory to God. That's our message. This is our subject this morning. Revelation 12, verse 6. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach where? And what's the message? Verse 7, fear God and give glory. How many came back to give glory? Not one Jew. How many give glory to God today? Not Harley 170 Adventist. You shouldn't say that. I didn't. God said it. That's where we're going. Jesus bids them, show thyself to the priests. They have faith to start on their way, believing in the power of Christ to heal them. As they go on their way, they realize that the horrible disease has left them, has left them. But only one has feelings of gratitude. Only one feels his deep indebtedness to Christ for this great work brought in him, for him. This one returns praising God, and in the greatest humiliation falls at the feet of Jesus, of Christ, acknowledging with thankfulness the work brought for him. And this man was a stranger, a Samaritan. The other nine were Jews. <laughs> Where are the other nine anyway? Right. Now, here's the problem from God, the problem without giving thanks. Because if you don't give thanks, your human tendency is to what? Here it is. Now we flash forward to today, uh, Butler Creek, Waynesboro Seventh-day Adventist Church, the year 2021, the day February the something, right? All heaven is looking upon our churches. Hmm. What are they saying? Upon parents and children and all of heaven, all of heaven, right? The unfallen world, the angels, they're all looking down here at the Seventh-day Adventist church saying what? Where the mother nine? Where the mother nine? The lesson which is recorded concerning the ten lepers should awaken in every heart the most earnest desire to change the existing order gratitude into one of praise and thanksgiving. Let the professed people of God stop what? Now, as far as health evangelism, if you murmur and complain, it turns you into an ice statue. Mm -hmm. If we are controlled by impulse or mere human sympathy, a few instances, ah, did something nice, didn't even say thank you. You do it the second time, see what happens to you. Oh, they did it again, didn't even say thank you. I cook like a dog all morning, the guest comes to eat lunch, doesn't even say thank you. Doesn't even... Or where gifts are abused or squandered, and what will it happen? Christians don't act from feeling and emotion, which does this. They act from what? I'll give you one example. In that apartment where we now do the hydrotherapy class, there was a man working in our program. This is years and years and years ago. We had a guest here. This, this person, this man was obnoxious. I mean, this was a hard guy to be around. I mean, this guy, he was an obnoxious man. Almost as obnoxious as me. Almost. <laughs> and then I got a call. I was, at, I was at the hospital in Wildwood. Got a call from the brother that was working in our program. The guy knocked at the door, the apartment up there, staff apartment back then. He opened the door, and the guy began to yell at this brother. And he said, Louie just yelled and yelled at me. I said, yeah, I can relate, right? Yeah, I know, I understand. Yeah. And then he said, you'll never guess what I did. What'd you do? I slam a door in his face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you know, principles never change. Feelings do. Yeah, pro is that a problem? Because mm -hmm. uh, now, how attitude affects health ministry. Sister Renee, you want to read? By the way, that's a picture of a what? Roller coaster. Roller coaster. Now, yeah, and this is the kind of experience we have to have, not a roller coaster. Sister Renee. To, to give or to labor when our sympathy, sympathies are moved, and to withhold our gifts or service when the emotions are not stirred mm. is an unwise and dangerous course. Now, dangerous to, to us or to... Both. Both, right? What do I? 
Hark, I hear mitral valve regurgitation, right? I think I hear that, right? No, it's a narrowing, a narrowing down of the valves to stenosis in my heart. And the doctor would say, you have a heart what? Murmur. Because a symptom of physical heart disease is a heart murmur. A symptom of spiritual heart disease is a mouth murmur. You know you're sick when, you're, when your heart murmurs. Yeah, because they're parallels, right? The physical, the spiritual, the natural, it's all parallel. And gratitude is a symptom of a deeper problem. It's spiritual heart disease. I mean, it's a killer, right? Number one killer of Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> Second death, right? Call the who? Doctor. Sister Nicole. For the sake of this one man who would make a right use of the blessing of health, Jesus healed the whole town. Amen, amen, yeah. The nine passed on without appreciating the work done and rendered no, gra no grateful thanks to Jesus for doing the work. Thus will be the physicians of the Health Institute Wait, thus will the physicians of the Health Institute have their labor and efforts treated. Mm -hmm. But if... Hey, well, yeah, it's the same thing here, right? Maybe, maybe, you know, you're up all night, somebody doesn't even say thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's all right. But if, it's a, it's a big if, but if. But if in their labor to help suffering humanity, one out of 20 makes a right use of the benefits received and appreciates the efforts in his behalf, the physician should feel satisfied and grateful. What about, keep going. <laughs> if one life is saved in 10 and one soul saved in the kingdom of God in 100, all connected with the Institute will be amply repaid for all the death. Let me expand it a bit. I've been here 22 years. In 22 years, if even one soul is saved, what? Thank you. Time well spent. Thank you. Time well spent. So out of here, I, I just draw two laws. It's right there. I'm reading it right there, right? Number one, it's not about numbers. Right. And number two, it's yeah, it's not about you. Because in this today, egocentric, the world revolves around, mm -hmm. it's all about mm -hmm. me. It's, uh, it's, how's it going to affect? Me. What's in it for? Me, 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 Now, you didn't do that with much life. It's all about me. me. Man, it's all about me. Me, myself, and yeah. I. How am I going to profit? Mm -hmm. Now, Sister Leah, I'd like you to read. I'll read the top. You read the bottom. We need to be aware of self-pity. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. Never. Indulge the feeling that you are not esteemed as you should be. That your efforts are not, he <laughs> doesn't appreciate me. I peeled carrots for two hours. That old ogre, that beast didn't even say thank you. Never, ever do that. True? Never. One time is one time too many. That your efforts are not appreciated, that your work, <laughs> I don't even get him paid anything to be here. Man, this is a tough place to work. Never ever it will shoot your immune system all to pieces that your work is too difficult sister leah I love your party. <laughs> well you did that no 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 you did that so well we'll let your mother do the next one <laughs> okay now let's take spiritual leprosy for a moment right i don't know about you i speak as my own my own self right i was diagnosed with spiritual leprosy <laughs> And I tell you what, I had lost everything. I'm honest. I'm being honest. I had no friends. I mean, you know, you know I mean a friend, right? Friend. I had no friends. I, the, the work, a crook? Come on. What kind of work is that? What kind of work is that? Would you be a crook, right? A crook? No friends. Worst marriage in the world. Darling, ready to divorce me every day. I had my health was going downhill, drinking myself to death. Right on down, I had nothing. I was diagnosed with spiritual leprosy, Matthew 8, 3 and 4, spiritual leprosy, and then the Lord healed me. By the way, I was also all alone. <laughs> and uh, He healed me, and He gave me back what? Give me the list. Everything. Yeah, you, you, no, you summed it all up. Wife? My wife, health. my health, fr health, friends, work. I had nothing. He gave me yeah. everything. Those lepers had nothing. Jesus gave them back what? And not one said thank you. Not one said thank you. 
And then the Lord said, forget them, how about you? Well, I'm thankful. I'm thankful, right? I'm thankful. I'm thankful. And then the Lord says, yeah, the Lord says, how thankful are you? Because in, the, uh, in, in, uh, in Texas, right, the capital punishment state, uh, capital of the world, right? Texas, the capital punishment place of the world. You go to Texas and they put you on death row. Is that the first death or the second death? The first? They can't give you the second death on death row in Texas. You can come off death row in Texas two ways. What are they? They're not president in Texas. Guess again. You're close. Governor. The governor. The governor. It's the governor. I guess the president could. But, you know, you're probably not going to get... Biden's probably not going to pardon you, right? The, uh, uh, the governor. What's the other way to come off? Easy. You die. Boom. You're gone. Now, uh, second death row. 323. How many have sinned? All. The wages of sin. 623. Death Romans. It's Romans. 623. You're on second death row. Everybody, everybody, not me, yeah, you, everybody's on second death row. There are only two ways to come off. Number one, die to second death. Okay. By who? The, say, governor. Isaiah 9, 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government, he's the governor. He carries the government on his shoulder. Now, the governor in Texas, to pardon you, takes how much effort? No, no red tape. No, the secretary does that. He assigns. <laughs> but Jesus, to pardon you, does what? He died. Yeah, he died for you. Just yeah, just accept it. Free gift. Cleanse from spiritual leprosy. Free gift. Okay. Are you thankful? Oh, yes. How thankful are you? How thankful? Are, now I change the question. How thankful are you that I forgave you? Because in order to get clean, you got to be forgiven. Well, I'm very thankful. Are you thankful enough to forgive others? Blessed are the merciful, 5-7 of Matthew, because they shall receive what? Mercy. Mother did not talk to her sister for 18 years. That's my aunt Selmy. I didn't talk to her for 18 years. And if you got that kind of cancer growing in your heart, your immune system, gone. If you go to church, you see somebody walking this way, you have a desire to walk that way, are you sure you're thankful for what God did for you? If you have some kind of a, 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 of a, of a schism, you got some kind of a, 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 what, what would you, ten, the tension, even, even tension. You got some kind of a, a, a separation. You got some kind of uh, estrangement. You got some kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you thankful? Thankful enough to mend a broken fence? We're just like those, uh, we're worse than them Jews. Yeah. Worse than those Jews. Can you see who those, uh, the, the, those two fine looking young men are? <laughs> That's me. Well, one young, fine looking young man and my brother, Steve, building the house I now live in. And Steve, all you all know Steve, right? He, he was a city boy, right? Could not hit a nail for it to save his life. He, didn't, he, did, he had a pretty good job of hitting his fingers, but not the nail. And every time he would hit it, this is not biblical, this came from Steve. He would hit his thumb, run around in circles. Oh, no. Oh, hit it again. You know, it could have been worse. It could have been worse. It could have been worse. Your car blew up. It could have been worse. Finish the sentence. You could have been in your car. You broke your leg. Finish the sentence. It could have been worse. You could have broken your neck. Anything that happens, it could always be worse. Isn't that true? It could always be worse. <laughs> There's a man here one time who cursed his shoes. This is before you and you got here. He cursed his shoes. He come and did a lecture. He was a guest cursing at his shoes. <laughs> one day he came in, didn't say a word about his shoes. What's wrong with him? I asked him. I said, hey, how are your shoes today? <laughs> how are your shoes? You know what he said? Shoes are fine. What happened? Made a man with no feet. The man with lousy shoes made a man with no feet. All of a sudden, he said, well, it, well, it could be a lot worse. He was glad to have those shoes. Today, who will read? Uh, Sister, uh, Brother Oliver. Yeah, you woke up this morning, didn't you, Oliver? You ought to say what? Thank you, because a whole lot of people didn't. If you're breathing, if you're on this side of the grave, you're on the north side of the ground, you are, uh, 
Yeah, something to be thankful for. There was a, there was a brother I was working with, and in fact, he's the one that built the school and built the apartment that uh, Aisha lives in. We were, uh, he'd come out of a, he was a guest here, came, got, got, got bab yeah, baptized, tremendous story. I was, we were building a house over there where Shirley lives, Gladys Sharp's her name, we're building a house over there. I sat down with, uh, with his brother, let's say his name, Mike, 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 what is, yeah, he's, he's, we're like this. There's Mike, here I am. I sat down to eat, best cook in the world. My wife is five-star cook, better than any cook on earth. I'm sorry, that's right, Ryan, <laughs> this is right. I, I married her and uh, I'm eating with high on the hog at my house. I pulled my lunch out. And Mike sits down over there, opens up a bag, pulls out a can of baby potatoes, a can of corn, a can of peas, gets a can open, opens it up, got a plastic spoon. Somebody's got it worse than you, don't they? I'm going home to Darlene. He's going home to a smelly German Shepherd dog named Duke. <laughs> yeah, somebody's got it worse than you. I know some of you have been to real poor places. I've lived in poor places. I got nothing to complain about, do I? Let's road test on Mrs. White. My husband died after 35 years of marriage. Could she practice what she preached? Brother Ryan, you want to read? At times I felt that I could not have my husband die, but these words seemed to be, seemed to be impressed on my mind. Be still and know that I am God. Paul, what should she say when her husband died? Praise the Lord, thank you. Let's see if she did it. Go ahead. I'm going to count it on my fingers as you read. I keenly, I keenly feel my loss, but dare not give myself up to useless grief. Mm -hmm. We will be thankful for the years of usefulness that we granted to him. And for his sake, and for Christ's sake, we will learn from his death a lesson which, will, which, we, will, which we shall never forget. We will let this bereavement make us more kind and gentle, more forbearing, patient, <laughs> and thoughtful toward the living. I take up my life work alone in full confidence that my Redeemer will be with me. And Mrs. White was no hypocrite. Wow. <laughs> now, if Darlene died, could I do that? You can. By God's grace. By God's grace. Only by His grace. He who is imbued with the Spirit of Christ abides in Christ. Now, this one was hard for me. Whatever comes to him, I'll upset my name, and let's per personalize it. Whatever comes to Lou comes from the Savior who surrounds him, Lou, with his presence. Nothing can touch Lou except by the Lord's permission. All our sufferings and sorrows, all our temptations and trials, all our sadnesses and griefs, all our persecutions and privations, in short, all things. all things, right? All things, huh? Work together for you. Now I read the rest, Ryan. All experiences and circumstances are God's workmen, whereby good is brought to us. All of them. Yeah. Sorrows are necessary to root out the root cause, which is self. Three ten of Matthew, the axe is laid at the root. Now that's a tough one. So I, I thought, oh, yeah, well, yeah, I love it. I mean, it's hard, but yeah. It's yeah, it's good for you. All right, car blows up. It's good for you. Sometimes some people just feel hopeless. Yeah. If you can think that you know what, this is from the This is it. And it's going to work. If I lose my trust, my life goes sour. If I can keep it, it stays sweet. This is a game changer. This is a life changer. So I started thinking. This is this morning. I started thinking. What would illustrate this? And I thought this is the best thing I can think of. Now in the book of the Acts, uh, book of the Acts, you should be my witnesses, right? You know, power's coming upon you. Go to the, you know, the book of Acts. The book of Acts did not end. It's still being written, isn't it? Yeah, it ended in the Bible, but today it's still being written. So you said you had the uh, Baptist Missionary Society, uh, 1792 it was established. You had a point where, you know, 1798 was coming around, Daniel, Book of Daniel was understood, uh, knowledge is increasing, men are running to and fro, mission work is being done in different places, right? It was going all over the place. You got Andrew, Phil Fuller, William Carey, all these guys going places with the gospel. Here's one there. Uh, 
because those who knew understood the obligation to share with those who don't. Pretty simple. This is, of course, the days before the internet and the telephone. So if you wanted to share with somebody in Africa, you got to go to Africa. And that's not as easy to do as Zoom, right? <laughs> right? So uh, I don't know if you ever heard of this lady, Helen Rosevere. There's a little book she read. Yeah. I took something, before I show you a video clip of her, I think she may be dead now. Yeah, I'm, she may be dead now. I'm not sure. She's very old. I want to, before I show you a video clip, I just want to give you the background on her. Okay, so let me read the background, then I'll show you the video. Helen Rosevere grew up in Belfast. This is being written by a teacher at Columbia Bible School. You'll see in a moment he introduces himself. Uh, Helen Rosevere grew up in Belfast, Northern Ireland. She became a skilled surgeon. She was a Protestant. All her life, both before and after she came to Christ, and during her university days, Helen Rosevere had a motto in the form of a question, is it worth it? Is that a good motto? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to go and spend eight years to get a degree, an advanced degree, a PhD in paleontology. I'm going to come out with a school debt of uh, $300,000. Is it worth it? I mean, it's good to ask, right? This, this, this man wants to ask me out on some kind of date. <laughs> Is he worth it? <laughs> you know, whatever. That's, that's a good motto. I like it. That's for a Christian, that's okay. She would ask and honestly answer that question before she did anything. Before she went out on a date, she would say, <laughs> Is it worth it? Before she would buy a book at Barnes & Noble and read it, she'd say, is it worth it? Before she took a course in college, she'd say, is it worth it? Now, she was not a Christian. Going into school, she was not a Christian at all. And by asking and answering that question honestly, she became a very well-educated, disciplined young woman physician. And after she graduated from Cambridge and got her hospital training, she gave her life to the Lord for missionary service in the northeast corner of the Belgian Congo in the community of Nobobongo. She served there for 11 years in the 50, 1950s and 60s. She did leprosy work, children's work, helped to build a hospital and Bible school. In 64, the Simba uprising took place in the Congo. I'll never forget the first time I met her. Now you see who's writing it. I was a guest teacher for 10 weeks at Columbia Bible College in South Carolina. My wife and I and our four kids were living in the men's dorm in two dorm rooms that they put together in a small makeshift little apartment for us. One night at 9 o'clock p.m., word came that all the men were to leave their studies and to go to the central lobby. A woman missionary was passing through campus that evening. She couldn't stay for the next day, and so they wanted the young men to hear her give a brief word of her testimony about her missionary work in Africa. To be honest, none of the boys were very excited, but the school said they had to do it, so we all went to the main lobby of the men's dorm. The guys were draped over the couches, sitting on the floor, and looking like they didn't want to be there. Then two of the school administrators walked in with Dr. Rosevear standing between them, uh, between the them, sorry, typo, and when we saw her, everybody's worst fears were realized. She looked just like a missionary. <laughs> Simple cotton dress, gray hair pulled back in a bit of a bun, very thick Coke bottle glasses, and she was tired. Somebody grabbed a folding metal chair and put it in the middle of the room of the floor. She sat down with the administrator. She sat down while the administrator said, Gentlemen, this woman, Dr. Rosevere, has just come through our campus. We want her to share a little bit of her experience with you tonight. And so she started to give her testimony. About two minutes into her testimony, she knew most of those young men were not interested at all, and so she stopped. She said, you know what, boys? I didn't want to bore you with all the details of my life. You've probably heard different stories and so forth. So it's late. Why don't we just take another five or ten minutes? I'll just answer questions. Maybe you have a question. I'd rather talk about the things you're interested in. One young man immediately raised his hand and asked, I've uh, got a question. You know, we've got missionaries coming through here all the time, and they're always talking about, you know, paying the price and suffering for Jesus. What did you ever suffer for Jesus? She sat there and looked at him and said, well, during the Simba uprising, I was raped twice. And then she told us about the assault. She told us how government soldiers came to her bungalow that night, came inside, ransacked it, beat her, threw her to the floor, and kicked in all of her teeth. She then, uh, and then two army officers, one at a time, took her to her bedroom and violated her body. Then after the second incident, she was dragged from the bungalow out into a clearing and tied to a tree. 
and standing around the tree were the laughing government soldiers. And then while she was standing there, beaten and humiliated and violated and ridiculed, someone discovered in the bungalow a handwritten manuscript of a book that she had been writing about the Lord's work in the Congo over the past 11 years. They brought it out, put it on the ground in front of her, and burned it. And as she saw that book go up in smoke, she clenched her teeth and she said to herself, is it really worth it? Eleven years of my life poured out in service for the people, and now this. And then as we sat listening in that dormitory room, she said, and boys, the minute I said that, God's Holy Spirit settled over that terrible scene, and He began to speak to me, and this is what He said. He said to me, Helen, my daughter Helen, you've been asking the wrong question all your life. Helen, the question is not, is it worth it? The question is, am I worth it? Am I worth it? Am I the Lord Jesus who gave His life for you worth this kind of sacrifice? And by her own tearful testimony, she told us how God broke her heart. She looked up into the face of Jesus and said, Oh Lord Jesus, yes, it is worth it for you are worthy. Now, this is uh, the little video clip I want you to watch. What a story of health evangelism. We were taken away and put in a prison. And uh, one day they came to me in the prison and everybody else around was protecting me because I had in many ways suffered more than many of them. But I heard them asking, that we were in a convent, they were asking the Mother Superior where was, nobody knew my English name, they all called me Mama Luca, Mama who Luca. was the doctor of the area. Uh, and they said, oh, they didn't have a Mama Luca, they only had my English name on the list. But anyway, they were saying that a Greek woman uh, who was expecting a baby was in great pain and they needed the doctor's help. So I went and I went with them and I went down and we went downtown, and I got a rebel soldier on either side of me with guns. And uh, you were in pretty rough shape. I'm pretty point. rough shape myself. <laughs> and they took me down to this home where I don't know there were possibly as many as 80 Greek Cypriots who were the uh, commercial workers of the area, and they were there with their wives, with their children, thrown into this house, taken captive by these rebels, and. They, they all knew me. I'd been their doctor for 12 years, and there was no other doctor in the area but me. Uh, and, uh, but it was as though nobody knew me. Their eyes were down, they were de in deep distress, and nobody looked up, and I had to walk through them, climb over them, into a room at the back where there was this little lady lying on a bed, obviously in pain. She was about seven months pregnant. And I was saying, God, what do you want me to do? I got rebel soldiers either side of me, uh, and God seemed to tell me what to do. Now, I, I could speak English and French and Swahili and a little bit of Lingala, but I couldn't speak Greek. So we had five languages there between us, and the rebels only knew two of them. So I would examine the woman and say in Swahili, does it hurt here? Then I'd repeat it in Bengala, does it hurt here? Then I'd say it in French, does it hurt here? And then I'd say in English to the Greeks, would you translate it into Greek, please? Uh, and the rebel soldiers presumed I was saying the same thing again, mm -hmm. uh, all the way down the line. And medical I, talk. It, medical talk. I talked to her, and after a bit I said, well, I'm going to give you some meds, I'm going to give you some meds, I'm going to give you some meds, and I'm going to pray with you. Will you pray the prayer after me in your own language? And I, I just gave them the gospel. And you I talked prayed to them about them, Jesus. Talked to them about Jesus and said how Jesus had died for them and all they had to do, and I prayed a prayer, a children's prayer of acceptance, and I heard all around the room the muttered, Amen, Amen. They were with me, they were following me in their distress. When I eventually left the house, they were all looking up and smiling and they wanted to shake my hands. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was wonderful. And, God, you are marvellous. You were like, they've, all these years I've preached them, they've never wanted to listen. But now because they know I suffered worse than they did, so they're willing to listen. They were open. And they listened, they were open. And yeah. 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 And uh, I'll tell you what I didn't put in here. I'll tell you just. She said after they, uh, you know, during this most difficult time, the soldiers were taking her to the next village to kill her. They're going to kill her. So they put a sack over her head, tied her to a stake, and had all the people in the village come out to pronounce sentence upon her. The people she had helped would be the ones that pronounced the death sentence on her. So they gathered up all the village people, pulled the sack off her head, and they saw that was her doctor. And uh, at, yeah, the sentence was not death, it was life. 
And then she's talking about she couldn't see at the time why she passed through that. But now she's old, right? She says, looking back, she said, I've spoken. She said 10, 15, 25,000 young ladies that have been raped and have been scarred mentally. And I could tell them, you don't have to worry about the, the man that touches your body. It's the man he can't touch your soul. And so she says, I was able to comfort tens of thousands of rape victims because of what I passed through. There's all these reasons and blessings that she couldn't see as she passed through it. And so in closing, I read this, Romans 8:18. 8, For I reckon the sufferings of this, what? Present time. Who'd like to finish it? Are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So if somebody were to ask me today, what have I ever given up for God? My only weak answer would be a beer bottle. And then they'd say, you gave that up for you. Mm-hmm. Never given up anything for God. I've been a receiver, but not a giver. They may come where he asks me to give something up. I'll pray. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful that uh, the book of Acts is still under construction, still being written. And uh, another example of how health evangelism is used by heaven to reach hearts that may not be reached any other way. Thank you for your mercies and grace. Thank you for what you've done for me. You've given me back everything. I've given you back nothing but some uh, heartache. Have mercy and help us. Send down the doctor. I need help. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.